Hello, you. What are you doing here? Are you here for another episode of The Daily Show, where we talk about interesting facts and trivia for everyone's daily knowledge? Well, if you are, then you're in the right place. Welcome. Welcome again for another episode. Uh, for today, we're going to be talking about being an entrepreneur. Did, <laughs> did I pronounce that right? Fast foods. We're going to talk about fast foods too. And uh, I guess we'll have to talk about buttons again. A um, few weeks ago, I did already talk about buttons, or more like collecting buttons, if I'm if I remember it correctly. Uh, this one's just plainly about buttons. And then for today in history, we'll talk about Oklahoma being a part of the United States, and uh, the sound of music, uh, the musical version, not the movie, but the musical. Uh, when it premiered on Broadway. We'll talk about that too. And then for this week, we'll travel to Bosnia um, and learn some of their national symbols. And as usual, uh, stay tuned for the stuff of the day. Anyways, before we start, I just want to ask, how are you guys doing? I hope you guys are doing great. And I hope that you would stick with me. You would stay with me here until the end of the episode. And yeah. I guess let's go ahead and uh, start. First would be, as usual, our today's observances. Our start, the first one, National Entrepreneur Day. See that? It's it, This word definitely has a uh, French uh, origin right there. Um, okay, so the word entrepreneur comes from the French word entreprendre. <laughs> now, the, the the French part, I don't think um, I was confident enough to pronounce it. Um, but that French word, that means undertake. Um, it first appeared in the French dictionary produced by Jacques de Brousselon, or Jacques de Brousselon, um, and published in 1723. That was like 300 years ago. Uh, the study of entrepreneurship stems from Irish French economist uh, Richard Richard. Cantillon back in the late 1700s and 18th century, uh, 17th, 18th century. Um, he defined the term entrepreneur in his book, Essay on the Nature of Trade in General. As a person who pays a certain price for a product and resells it at, a, at an uncertain price. Kind of like, you know, a buy and sell. Uh, Cantillon emphasized the willingness of the entrepreneur to take on the risk and deal with the uncertainty. <clears throat> Sounds adventurous, isn't it? Thus, distinguishing the difference between the entrepreneur and the investor. Um, another French economist, Jean Baptiste, Jean Baptiste, say, identified entrepreneurs as drivers for economic development. Because they're the ones taking the uh, the risk. So and again, it's it's like risk reward system, or you know like that's that's the uh, code that entrepreneurs are following. So there's gonna be a risk there, of course. <clears throat> the lower the risk, the I mean most of the time the higher the risk, the higher the the reward, right? Uh, but there are some times where you could get lower risk for a higher um, reward. Um, let's see where, oh, I mean, what else? In the 1930s, economist Joseph Schumpeter, Schumpeter <laughs> defined an entrepreneur as uh, someone willing and able to convert a new idea or invention into a successful innovation. Uh, for him, entrepreneurship resulted in new industries and combinations of currently existing inputs. His example of this uh, was the combination of the steam engine and the wagon in order to produce the horseless carriage. So, <clears throat> um, if we go back in time, uh, a lot of our ancestors depended on a specific animal, which is the horse, right? And maybe other animals too, you know, to carry their uh, carriage back in the day. But because someone risked to make an idea of... Uh, a uh, steam engine where the, the, the energy of a, a certain vehicle or cart carriage at that time 
uh, is not being powered by an animal. Instead, uh, you know, the source of energy is from f from a different source, um, and that became the uh, the foundation and the basis of our <clears throat> car these days. Because I mean, obviously, you can see our cars are not powered by horses, even though the the power of a car is measured by the term horsepower and well again if we're going to be talking history about history um it's because uh, horses were mostly the uh, um <clears throat> the animal that helped us uh do our transportation so yeah there you go i think my voice is getting dry again <laughs> what's going on hold on one second Does it sound better now? There you go. Oh, man. All right. In 2010, entrepreneur Simak Tagados um, stated a petition to create this holiday, uh, this observance of uh, the uh, National Entrepreneur's Day. Uh, he didn't understand how America, though considered the most entrepreneurial country in the world, didn't already have a day dedicated to recognizing entrepreneurs, you know? <clears throat> So six months and thousands of signatures later, President Obama proclaimed the last day of 2010's National Entrepreneur Week as the National Entrepreneur Day, which is uh, today. The uh, oh, did I tell you guys this episode is for uh, uh, November 16th? Just in case I forgot. Yeah, that's for December 16th. Well, give me one moment. It should say though. Yeah, right there. See. I don't know. I wasn't sure because I, I I forgot to mention what uh, episode this uh, or what day is this episode for. <clears throat> All right. Um, with that said, that's the first observance. Moving on to the next observance, uh, definitely something that I guess we can discuss in the comment section below because this is a very common thing here in uh, the U.S. Right or pretty much around the world. Fast food. Fast food, a very convenient way to get your uh, food and get, get, you know, uh, to, to quench your hunger. To uh, quench your thirst and to satisfy your hunger. There you go. <clears throat> but for this observance, we will instead talk about uh, the history of how fast food or fast foods were, were made, were created. You know, the idea. So, believe it or not, the roots of fast food can be traced back to ancient Rome. Yeah. Uh, Thermopoleums were small shops that sold food such as hot sausages and bread on the go. Um, urban apartment dwellers in the middle and lower classes often ate these foods. And again, we're talking about the ancient Rome time, you know. And then during the Middle Ages, vendors sold food to people in larger cities such as London and Paris. Then after 1860, fish and chips shops uh, became prevalent in the United Kingdom um, and uh, became popular with the working classes. Then uh, fast forward to the 1920s, there were more than 35,000 of these shops. There you go. But what is fast food really? I mean, you can take the word literally fast food. So it's a food. A type of food that you uh, prepare uh, fast enough, you know. Um, but the term fast food may first have been used here in America by George G. Foster, who, in his book uh, New York Slices, published in 1848, uh, referred to as the fast paced food in New York City's business district, an automat, a uh, cafeteria with vending machine with pre made food was opened by Horn and Hardart um, in 1902. Uh, that's in Philadelphia, by the way. Um, a decade later, they opened one in uh, New York City, which created a sensation. I mean, again, any other, any uh, type of, uh, or anything new, anything new in general, it will definitely get um, the attention of the public. Uh, it could go either way, right? Uh, people will be excited to this new idea or people will be cautious and worried and and and, and uh, uh, not so welcoming in the, in the new idea so I guess in the case of fast food well uh, 
it, it was pretty much welcomed. You know, it was pretty much welcomed by the majority, by by the majority of the public. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, again, a decade later, they opened one in New York City, which created a sensation, and many more were built across the country, leading to the popularity of automats during the 1920s, 1930s, and then. Even though we're talking about food, technological, social, and economic changes in America also contributed, you know, led to a boom in fast food restaurants by the second half of the 20th century. Um, following World War I, automobiles became popular and affordable, and curb service restaurants were created in the 1920s. Because uh, again, back, back then, you know, classic approach for you to eat out out of your outside your house outside your home is to drive to a restaurant but you're going to be like dining in right you're gonna uh, be served uh, be seated inside the restaurant and you eat and of course you're gonna be like or the wait waiters waitresses will be taking your orders before it uh, before it's prepared um, during the uh, Post World War II economic boom, uh, people spent more and bought more, creating a culture of consumerism. Consumerism, there you go. Consumerism that led to both men and women working outside the home. Um, eating outside the home, which was once a luxury, thus became a commonplace. There you go. Because of the expendable cash, um, and in some instances because it was a necessity, by the 1951, or by 1951, Merriam-Webster had added the word fast food, there you go, to their dictionary. <clears throat> so that's a little bit of history of fast food and then we all know from there, there were, uh, I mean, during those times, you got these iconic, uh, some, uh, not some, but a lot of these iconic fast food restaurants that were, that, that, that came into popularity, of course, McDonald's would be uh, one of those uh, fast foods, right? <clears throat> and um, if you uh, are not that familiar with the history of McDonald's, I would recommend you guys to learn more about it. It's actually interesting, you know. It was built by, or it was, it started, it was started by uh, uh, two brothers, you know, um, they, that they were, <clears throat> well, I'm not going to tell you their names, um, because you will that that will be your that will be your uh, personal challenge, you know. To if, if you don't know the name of the brothers who started McDonald's, uh, I'm gonna task you to find out their names. There you go. But to tell you more about them, they were actually victims of poverty too, and uh, the reason why they started uh, with that idea is to provide. Uh, uh, that assistance uh, to provide food for the hungry because they they themselves actually felt what it's like to not be able to eat regularly and you know on a daily basis and they actually wanted to help they actually wanted to help by you know if uh, with their idea they thought that they believed actually they believed that uh, they could help other people um, be not hungry, you know. Uh, considering that not only it's it's uh, it's prepared fast, fast enough. Um, it's all it was also very affordable, especially at that time. You know, we're talking about again, we're talking about somewhere around 1920s. So, yeah, and then uh, Mr. Ray Kroc. Now I'm going to uh, mention his name, Mr. Ray Kroc, because I mean, when you say McDonald's, his name is. Uh, definitely related now to McDonald's, you know, Mr. Ray Kroc. So, Mr. Ray Kroc was um, <clears throat> was a businessman, generally a businessman, trying to uh, find new ways of of uh, of course earning cash, right? And he saw the pot the potential of uh, the what the brothers did or what the brothers had started. And boy, I mean, he wasn't wrong because now, as of now, McDonald's would be one of the most iconic popular uh fast food chains in the whole world not just in the us but in the whole world right i mean when you say mcdonald's pretty much
much anyone knows it right <laughs> well by now so yeah um but again if you want to learn more definitely there are a lot of uh, resources out there um for you to read especially on wikipedia uh, i'm sure there are some youtube videos about the history of mcdonald's also it's quite interesting it's quite interesting i don't want to uh, tell you more about it because uh, if, you know this is just one of our observances we have other observances to talk about but yeah so anyways going back to fast food in general even though they're tasty even though they're uh <clears throat> They're convenient and tasty. Well, you might or you may want to be cautious of eating uh, fast food often. You know, um, fast food is typically high in sugar or salt, um, also saturated fat and calories, and is and could link to many health problems, especially if you are um, <clears throat> eating fast food on a daily basis. Basis, you know, it's uh, it's not a good idea, and just like any other. Um, thing that we are talking here, talking about here in the uh, daily show, uh, we always encourage everyone to do things or eat things or or experience things moderately. You know, <clears throat> and yeah. So, just gonna make sure you know, um, fast food. It's tasty and it's convenient, but don't make it as a daily meal. You know, if ever, it's still better for you to eat something else I mean fast foods fast foods are definitely good uh, for convenience mainly you know if you don't have time to prepare your own food um, or let's say you forgot your lunch from work then yeah that's another one um, even though by the way even though a lot of uh, these fast foods now are saying that they they tend to uh, stick to the healthier side uh, it may be true, but not entirely true. Not because they said it's healthier than their past menu doesn't mean that it's totally healthy. All right, so it could be, it, it would be maybe they have a new menu that is quote unquote healthier than their past menus. Okay, good, but again, um, th those are fast food and um, their supplies uh, has to be preserved. And one way for you to preserve them is to put a lot of. Uh, salt <laughs> so yeah i mean um just just watch out just watch out right oh by the way before we move on um what's your favorite fast food i mean even though you're not eating on a sp uh, in a specific fast food on a daily basis right um you, you would still have your favorite fast food and uh from there uh let me know what your favorite fast food is um for me I'm gonna say, you know, California Sprite in and out That's my favorite fast food. And yes, <laughs> I consider that fast food even though the line is so long that your waiting time is not fast enough compared to, let's say, McDonald's or Carl's Jr. or Wendy's or, or Burger King. Uh, I guess I just named all the uh, fast foods that I know. But yeah, what about you guys? What's your favorite fast food? Let me know in the comment section below. Oh, and also, what's your favorite item in that fast food? Because it could be a fast food, but not necessarily burgers, right? Even though most of them serve burgers. Like, for example, I would consider Jollibee to be fast food. Uh, they do have burgers, but that's not their main thing. Their main thing is chicken, you know? Alright, next up, we got National Button Day. So, uh, plain and simple buttons. Uh, it's like an appreciation for buttons. Um... Although there are many kinds of buttons, the most accounts National Button Day celebrates buttons that are used in clothing um, for ornamentation or as fasteners. Uh, the first buttons were used for or ornamentation and seals and have been found in the Indus River Valley and we're talking about 2800 to 2600 BCE. Now remember if it's BC or BCE, um, the, the count of the years are backwards. So the first part of the year, if you have like a a window time for the year, the first one will be higher than the second one. Um, all right, and then in China also they were found between 2000 to 1500 BCE, and in ancient Rome. 
Um, and then also, the oldest known button dating to 5000 BCE was made from a curved shell and found in the Indus River Valley. Ooh. I mean, 5,000 years ago, people are already using buttons. Well, I mean, now we we can pretty much manufacture anything uh, very easy, you know. Um, but back in the day, 5,000 BCE, I mean, I don't think factories were around that time. So you gotta have to do it manually, you know, with your hand, with your skills, uh, which is pretty awesome. Um, buttons that function as fasteners along with button holes. Uh, didn't come about until the 13th century where they first appeared in Germany and spread out through or spread throughout Europe uh, They have been uh, made from almost every material their composition often reflecting the uh, popular materials of the era in which they were made um, Today they are most often constructed out of hard plastic. Yeah, that's the most common button now uh, metals uh, for I would say Levi's, are, they, they still do have metal buttons. Um, seashells that I haven't... I have to check my button shirts and my button apparels if I do have some uh, seashell buttons. That would be cool. Uh, wood, yes, yes. They, they were also made from wood before. Um, they have been created by, by artisans, artists, uh, crafts, people, out of raw materials or found objects such as uh, fossils or from combination of both. Uh, they have been made in small quantities or in large-scale quantities at factories. There you go. So those are our observances for today, guys. Um, only three. Uh, we don't have any other notable observances. And with that said, moving on to today in history. So we got two. Actually, the first one right here. In 1907, um, Indian Territory and Oklahoma Territory collectively entered the United States as just Oklahoma, uh, the, which happened to be the 46th state. Now, I hope you guys remember this because you remember we do have the uh, the U.S. state trivia. So if, if a question comes up, which is this, you know, like which state became the 46th state? Well, you guys already know, Oklahoma. Now you have to work out the rest. <laughs> um, anyways, Oklahoma, with the name derived from the uh, Choctaw Indian word Okla, or words, because it's actually two words, Okla meaning people and then Hama meaning red, uh, has a history of human occupation dating back 15,000 years ago. That's a very long time ago. Uh, the first Europeans to visit the region were Spanish explorers in the 16th century. And in the 18th century, the Spanish and French struggled for uh, control of the territory they were fighting. The United States acquired Oklahoma from France in 1803 as part of the Louisiana Purchase and uh, that's a good review for you um, if you were attending Ian's uh, Zoom session right there. Um, Oklahoma initially prospered as an agricultural state but the drought years of the 1930s kind of made it made the state part of the Dust Bowl you know during the depression poor tenants farmers known as Okies were forced to travel west seeking better opportunities. Um, in the 1940s, prosperity returned to Oklahoma and oil production brought the major brought a major economic boom in the 1970s. You know what else is boom? Like boom in a good way, I guess. The musical of Sound of Music 1959 right there with the creative team made up of Broadway legends and stars as enormously popular and bankable as Mary Martin, it was no surprise that the Sound of Music drew enormous advanced sales. Um, the Sound of Music was an instant success, and numerous songs from its score, including, you know, the classic Do Re Mi, My Favorite Things, and Climb Every Mountain, quickly entered the popular canon. Uh, this original cast recording of the uh, Sound of Music was nearly as big a phenomenon as the show itself um, recorded just a week after the show's premiere um, in 1959 and released by Columbia Records the album shot to the top of the Billboard's album charts pretty amazing and I know a lot of you guys remember Sound of Music as the movie you know um, but yes they started as a musical 
All right, notable figures born today. I think I got more than one, I'm pretty sure. We got WC Handy right there. Uh, WC, uh, William Christopher. There you go, that's his name, William Christopher Handy. Uh, he was born in Florence, Alabama, and he was an American composer and musician. He became one of the most influential American songwriters, and he happened to be known as the father of blues. Um, well, he did. Well, he didn't create the blues genre, but he took it from a regional music style, you know, Delta blues, uh, which is related to his style, with a limited audience to one of the dominant national forces in American music. And the next one, we have Zina Garrison. Oh, Garrison. Let me say that again. Okay. Zina Garrison. There you go. 1963. She was born in Houston, Texas. Um, she's an American tennis player and best known for making the Wimbledon finals in the 1990s. Uh, she was also a three-time Grand Slam mixed doubles champion. Uh, when you say mixed doubles, by the way, in tennis, um, it's it's the combination of male and female tennis players. So, um, because, you know, like, there's going to be men's tennis game and then women's tennis game. So, the mixed doubles uh, would be a man and a woman. You know, male and female in one team, and they're playing doubles. Um, so yeah, Grand Slam mixed doubles champion and a women's double doubles gold medalist at the 1988 Olympic Games. So she also played in the Olympics. Pretty awesome. Um, those are our notable figures born today. All right, place of the week. My script says Algeria. It's not really Algeria. It's Bosnia, Bosnia, Bosnia. There you go. Yay, we got an awesome dog here that, it, yes, this is their national animal. It's uh, Tornyak. That's how you pronounce it. Yeah, Tornyak. The uh, Tornyak is the national animal of Bosnia. It is a large, well proportioned, and agile, um, agile sheep like, uh, or a sheep dog, or sheep like dog. That that does that make sense? I mean, just look at the picture right there. <laughs> Their long and thick hair is adequate to protect it against cold weather during winter. Uh, the clear, self-confident, and calm look uh, by this dog makes it uh, it a Bosnian's national animal. And by the way, this dog is a large and powerful um, breed, well proportioned and agile. Again, uh, the shape of the body is almost square. The bone is not light, but nevertheless, not heavy nor coarse. Um, its coat is long and thick. Uh, the body of this dog is strong and well built with harmonious and dignified movements. The hair is long and thick and adequately protects the uh, body. Um, again, when it comes to uh, cold weather, winter time, something like that. The tail is shaggy, uh, kept high like a, like a flag. Um, and as far as the uh, character of this dog, the Torniak has a clear, self-confident, serious, and calm look uh, to it right there. In general, uh, Torniak is a long-coated dog with short hair over the face and legs. The top coat is long, thick, coarse, and straight. It is especially long on the upper part of the croup, um, over the shoulders, and at the back, and slightly wavy. I mean, but I guess the, uh, the, the bottom line is... They have a pretty cute looking national animal. That that is pretty awesome, you know. Uh, and it's not in the wild too. You know, a lot of um, a lot of national animals in a lot of countries um, are animals in the wild. But this one, uh, definitely domesticated Tornyak right there. Um, next would be the national flower, golden lily, right there. This is a perennial plant that grows up to five foot tall, five feet tall. The uh, leaves are narrow, uh, lance shaped, smooth, grayish, gr grayish green, and up to four inches long. Right there, you can see in this, in the picture right there. Um, this spectacular flower is orchid-like, golden, orange, and yellow, and often with spots. Um, it, though you don't see the spots here in this picture, um, they typically bloom from June to August. There you go, and then. For Bosnia, again, another picture of football or soccer. Um, but aside from basketball and football, uh, which are their popular sports, 
Uh, volleyball is also uh, a big game for them. And then uh, there are other opportunities for sports also such as mountain biking, hiking, and rock climbing. There you go. So those are our national stuff, national things, national symbols for Bosnia. All right, moving on to stuff of the day. Animal Disney version, we have Frank. There you go. Frank is a character from Disney's 1990 animated film, The Rescuers Down Under. Now, I haven't personally seen this animated film, but maybe some of you guys did. Let me know if you, you've seen this um, uh, animated film. And was it good? Yeah. But anyways, Frank is a character that is based from a green frill-necked lizard who was captured by Percival uh, C. McLeach. Uh, Frank is terrified of being killed and uh, turned into a purse. I mean, because I'm mean, a lizard, I guess. Lacoste. <laughs> or, I mean, like the scale, right? That's, uh, uh, unfortunately, that's like, you know, how us humans turn animals like lizards into something for us you know it, it's either the uh, the turn them into purses or or uh, coats you know oh man but good thing we know how to make like fake ones now which kind of feels like the real thing still so anyways he his character he's extremely cowardly and hyperactive like he he's very anxious he's very, very scared at everything pretty much but um, the actual picture of a frill neck lizard is right there. There you go. See that? See that? Right there? Right the neck part right there? Um, yeah, there you go. So that's a picture of frilled, frilled, oh my gosh, frilled lizard. There you go. Um, it's a type of reptile, as you guys can see. Uh, it's found in Australia, in New Guinea, um, that can run standing up on its hind legs with its forelegs and tail in the air like so like it, it could stand in, in two legs while running <laughs> the scaly membrane around its neck is is its neck is used as a large part of the lizard's defensive po uh, posture normally uh the neck frill often as wide as the lizard is long lies like a uh, cape over the shoulders when the lizard is irritated or threatened you know just like uh frank it can raise the frill perpendicular to its body, enabling it to surprise its enemy or enemies by suddenly displaying a head several times its normal size. There you go. That's also to scare other animals away, you know, if uh, if someone's going to attack uh, this lizard. All right, our fall plant of the day, we got the uh, oak leaf hydrangea. Oak leaf hydrangea has 8 to 12 inch long leaves shaped like oak leaves. I mean, that's why it's called oak leaf. Uh, they are born on stiff, upright, hairy stems which occasionally branch. A fuller shrub can be created by pinching the new growth or cutting back old growth. Um, the plant grows in sun or shade and prefers a rich, moist soil. Not a dry soil, so moist soil. Oh, I think I hit my mic right there. Um, in the northern part of its range, the top usually dies back during winter and it needs shelter from high winds. Uh, this sprawling, slow-growing shrub reaches 6 to 10 feet tall and spreads 3 to 5 feet. The flowers produced in midsummer in panicles are at first white, then fade to pink and then tan. So by the time it's... Uh, it's fall then you know they would have a different color all right next up we have musical artist of the day we have taylor swift for the whole month and uh one of her uh best songs for me uh i mean she's got a lot of songs that i like too um style is the title uh and also i'm sorry for the typo right there it says one two zero one four it's actually 2014 there you go it was released 2014 and i don't want you guys getting confused the name of the album where this song was included is 1989 but it was released in 2014 i think i did mention that to you guys last time but yeah it's a pretty good song for me you know it's not country anymore um again she moved 
she moved away from country music um, like a long time ago so she started making um, pop music pop means popular and I guess pop is or mainstream I would say that mainstream right there but regardless this song was a pretty good song it is a pretty good song that was I still like this song I listen to it uh, from time to time so if you haven't seen if you haven't seen if you haven't heard or if you haven't listened to this to this song well uh, now's your chance again the title is style you know by Taylor Swift Moving on to our 11 word or the, not 11 word 11 letter word of the day for November contraption it's spelled as c o n t r a p t i o n there we go it's a noun and it basically means a machine or device that appears strange or unnecessarily complicated you know and often badly made or unsafe like just I guess a prototype pretty much well not really prototype but yeah uh, imagine a, a device that doesn't look safe yes that's what a contraption is yeah. I'm gonna say like a uh, a mousetrap would be what because it kind of looks dangerous if you if you see it you know all right moving on last part of our show we have the uh, thanksgiving trivia for the whole month and then again next month we're gonna do all the christmas trivia the heaviest turkey ever raced was 86 pounds now wait i mean you you guys know how big turkeys can grow right but if if we're talking about pounds or the weight you have no idea so we're gonna do a comparison or yeah yeah, yeah a comparison right there. So your average turkey, you know, with uh, with your visual memory of how big the turkey will be or the turkey is, um, they only weigh about 22 pounds. Yes, there you go. So when you compare it to the heaviest turkey ever raised, which was 60 or 86 pounds, that means that turkey, that heaviest turkey recorded was four times not bigger. It could be significantly bigger than a regular turkey but uh, as far as the weight is concerned it's four times the regular of the average weight of a wild turkey right there so from 22 to 86 pounds um, I wonder if that turkey was served in Thanksgiving I mean I hope not <laughs> right there but if ever ooh, that's a lot of meat I'm just saying for 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 Thanksgiving right there um, there you go guys that's the end of our show today i hope you like it i hope you learned something new um thank you as always thank you for always joining me here doing some chill episodes uh even though uh you watch this in the morning or afternoon i from what it looks like if you can guess i'm kind of recording at night and um, i have my indoor voice <laughs> not so loud but yeah there you go don't forget to leave your thoughts about the topics we discussed in the comment section below and as always i'll see you in the next one i'll have to say goodbye for now uh take care guys <laughs>